Okay. All right. Um, great. Well, thanks everybody who's uh, showed up tonight. I'm going to just share my screen here real quick and we'll go through a quick little business meeting before we get to um, Will's presentation. So can you guys see my slide here? Yep. Okay. So yep. um, I think most of you know all this information, but um, so we're the Midnight Sun Flycasters, uh, Interior Alaska's uh, Fly Fishing Club, established in 1976. And uh, the goals of the club are to share knowledge, develop and refine skills, and learn and promote fly fishing and fish conservation in Interior Alaska. And uh, if anybody's not, um, you know, wants more information, definitely check out our social media and website. Um, we do a lot of interesting stuff like the, the kids camp, you can see in the photo there, happens every summer where... Um, Kids can learn how to, to fish, to tie flies, to identify fish and insects. Uh, it's a really great thing that's put on by the club. Um, additionally, there's fly tying nights, uh, stream cleanups, other get togethers. So definitely um, quite a bit going on, maybe less so in COVID times, but um, let's see. And so just a few announcements before I hand it over to Will, who's gonna talk about um, Chino River salmon conservation and Cripple Creek restoration tonight. Um, so, um, as you might have seen, we posted on the Facebook page, the 2021 Alaska fishing licenses can now be purchased. If anybody um, is wanting to get a jump on the season and get their licenses, make sure you don't get into the new year without your license. If you're going to be out ice fishing or even open water fishing down the Kenai or something, it's a good time to get one. And it's also kind of a cool gift for, you know, if you want to get somebody a Christmas present or whatever, get them their fishing license um, for the year. That's a, be a very useful gift for somebody. Um, also, there's a comment period open right now for the Fish and Game annual stocking plan. And for Interior Alaska, it's kind of seems like um, they're doing usually what they do, putting in a lot of Chinook and rainbow trout into the local lakes. Um, but in starting in 2023, they have slated to start stocking grayling again, which is cool. Um, it seems like they haven't done that for a few years. I remember maybe 10 years ago, we would catch some grayling in Birch Lake and whatnot, but I think they haven't been stocking them for a while. So that's cool. They're going to um, start doing that again. And then there's some lake trout stocking for Harding Lake and some of the Delta Junction area lakes um, that'll happen in 2022 and 2024. Um, I think they even stocked some this year, maybe. And they hadn't done that for quite a while either. So that'll be cool. Maybe there'll be actually some younger, dumber fish that I can actually catch out of Harding. <laughs> Um, also, you might have seen that uh, we shared this ugly sweater uh, fly tying night that Trout Unlimited is putting on. It's a virtual thing over Zoom, uh, December 21st. Um, and so if anybody wants to, you know, bust out their ugly sweaters, I've got mine, um, and tie some flies in a festive setting, and you can socially distance and be virtual or, you know, go wherever you want to do that. Um, that's, uh, I think that's a free event that you can do um, and just look on our page or Trout Unlimited's page to get the info for that. Um, so, and then just a few more things. So our, our banquet that usually happens in March, um, we're not sure if we'll uh, have one this year just with COVID and you know we, with the vaccine is starting to roll out, but we don't know what the situation will be by that time. So we'll kind of play things conservatively and we'll see if we do a banquet or not, kind of play it by the ear. Um, and then our kids camp is hopefully gonna go forward. It's scheduled for June 11th through 13th at Lost Lake Boy Scout camp. Um, everything's looking pretty good for that as far as the vaccine coming out. So hopefully by the summer, the, things will be much safer. And if not, you know, we'll definitely adjust for that. But um, And um, just a plug for next month's meeting, um, I'll be talking about um, fishing in New Zealand. I lived over there for a few years. And um, so rather than talk about trout, which is what most people talk about when they go to New Zealand, I'll kind of get into some of these other less known species that hopefully people will be interested in, um, like the amberjack on the bottom right there. There's uh, good opportunities for European perch, other saltwater species, and even some of the native species like uh, the longfin eel there on the bottom left. So that's kind of what we got going on. Um, Oliver and Will, do you have anything to add? Any other events or anything like that? Uh, yeah, just for um, as far as the Trout Unlimited stuff goes, um, See, I don't know if I know Fred is, um, and I think you are as well, Kevin, um, um, probably on the email distro list for Trout Unlimited stuff. Um, I'm having issues all of a sudden with the Trout Unlimited website. I don't really know what's going on, but um, yeah, there will be more emails about that ugly sweater fly tying 
um, event. Um, they'll probably be pretty last minute, but if I can get an email list from John Morak, um, there'll be more to come on that. Um, so that's all I got just for talk on that for a second. I don't get the Trout Unlimited emails. I, I, I am a Trout Unlimited member, I think, but it seems like there's a little disconnect between like the national organization and more of the local chapters. So I don't know, you know, some of that might get lost. You, you, I'll definitely- You might have to, Sorry. you might have to jump in and sign up um, for the local chapter. Okay. Um, I think that's, um, that is a requirement to get the, to get the, uh, the emails about the local chapter stuff, but um, I can kind of walk you through how to do that as well, because not too long ago I had to do it myself. So, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll but that's the same, that. same goes for anybody. Okay, cool. Will anything from you? Nope. I'm just wishing I was fly fishing instead of trying to ice fish. <laughs> well, if you go down the Kenai, you can do that, I suppose. <laughs> long drive, but. right. Okay, well, we'll so I'm, I'll introduce Will here and let him jump into his talk for tonight. So, um, of course, Will is our vice president here at Midnight Sun Flycasters, and uh, he's born and raised around Fairbanks, pretty much, right, Will? Um, yep. And he's guided. He's uh, you know a great river man, uh, likes to canoe and and float, and uh, just kind of an all all around outdoors guy. And also, he's a student at UAF um, in the Natural Resource Management program, and with a minor in fisheries. And so um, he's working on being involved in this Cripple Creek restoration project that he'll talk a little bit about tonight, but um, his, his talk will go beyond just that. And he'll talk about some salmon conservation in the Chena River and uh, some of these restoration efforts. So Will, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will hand it over to you. All right, sounds good. I might need to tweak the settings to let you share. Okay, you should be able to now. Give me just a second to get it all set up right. Yeah, take your time. And you guys can hear me all right. And can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Most of it. Yes. So um, hopefully my talk will bounce a little bit off of the lecture that we had last week from Mike Lundy. Um, he was talking about uh, adult Chinook salmon and, and fly fishing for them. Um, basically A to Z, everything you need from gear, locations, habitat. Um, and then how to fish them, how to tie flies for them. So hopefully uh, I'll, we'll kind of show the other side of that. We'll show the juvenile life, life stage tonight and kind of the research and management that goes behind them, some of the issues that um, the agencies are facing today. And then of course, uh, a couple case studies of the projects that I was able to work on recently. Um, so I wanted to start out with just a quick review of um, kind of how the management um, works in Alaska, especially. So. Um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game is generally the agency that's responsible for uh, managing fish and wildlife uh, in the state. And that's actually written into the Alaska Constitution. Um, across the United States, that's pretty common for the individual states to be responsible for managing their fish and wildlife. So um, in our Constitution, it's, it's written that um, our natural resources are to be developed in the best interest of the people in the economy, um, that they're for, for the public and, and the people of Alaska, um, that they're supposed to be reserved for the common use of people. Um, so for example, like exclusive fisheries aren't permitted. So um, nobody can come in and say, well, guides in this area bring in a lot of revenue. So they're the only ones allowed to fish here. So, um, and generally it's, it's a pretty positive progressive way that Alaska manages our resources. Um, and then a, a big thing that I'm, I'm really happy that is written into our, um, the charter of fish and game is that these resources must be managed according to the sustained yield principle. And if you guys don't know um, what that is, it's it's a pretty simple idea, basically, that we have abundant resources and we want to be able to maintain those for 
uh, a long time. And so a sustained yield would basically be setting our, our harvest limits, whether it's timber or fish or wildlife, and, um, and setting our harvest limits in a way that they can reproduce and, and we're not um, shrinking the population size so that we basically have a, an infinite yield from these populations. It's kind of the whole idea around conservation in general. Um, and then one of the really progressive things about um, fish and game and management in Alaska is the Board of Fish and the Board of Game. And um, those are uh, members of the public, members of the community selected by the governor uh, at the time. And uh, they are intended to represent the um, stakeholders of Alaska, of Alaska natural resources. So there's supposed to be um, people from native groups on the board of fish and game. There's supposed to be guides. There's supposed to be business owners and, and so on and so on. And I like to note that just because a lot of the times when I'm um, discussing these subjects with people, they don't really understand that um, the biologists in fish and games aren't often the ones setting the regulations. It's typically those big decisions, what comes out in the reg book um, and what, what you're looking at for, you know, when you're deciding where to hunt or fish, those are actually decided by um, representatives of the public and they have public hearings and, and it's definitely easy to get involved. You can write public comments. I just had a, a friend of mine who wrote a public comment and, um, and got published in the newspaper for it recently. And um, so I would encourage you to, to that that's um, to take advantage of that. It's not necessarily uh, the case across the rest of the um, United States or across the rest of the world. So we're in a pretty lucky spot here in Alaska. And um, I definitely um, implore you to, to become involved in that process since we have the ability to. Um, and then outside of fish and game, there is other agencies that have a stake in the management um, of our resources. So for example, tonight I'll be talking about U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, they have some authority with um, international species. So like migratory birds um, or fish species that migrate across borders like Pacific halibut or um, like Chinook salmon, like we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, because of uh, ANILCA, they've got um, some claim to subsistence rights. And um, so they've, a lot of their research and management activities focus on subsistence um, activities. And then any species listed on the Endangered Species Act, um, they're all, the, the federal government's also involved in that. Um, so aside from that, they often help with um, agencies. And that's what we're gonna go into more detail about that later when I talk about some of the projects happening um, here in the interior as some case studies for that. And then of course on federal lands, um, some of these uh, agencies like the US Forest Service uh, or the National Park Service have a little bit more say on what happens on their federal parks and, and property. But so understand that it's, it's complex, but this is kind of the basic framework of, um, of how our resources are supposed to be managed in Alaska. So with that, um, we'll start out with the bad news, um, discussing some of the conservation concerns of, um, of Chinook salmon in interior Alaska. So um, over the past two to three decades, since about the, the mid 1990s, um, Chinook salmon in the Yukon River have been decreasing. And this trend is also followed statewide. Um, they've been decreasing in abundance uh, and size in general. And these trends have also followed in interior Alaska. You can see down here, the um, Chena and Sulcher rivers have seen a um, smaller escapement over the past 20, 25 years. Um, and, and one of the interesting things that's not necessarily well known is that these interior rivers contribute a really significant portion of Chinook salmon to um, the Yukon River Basin. So for you guys that don't know, the um, Fairbanks, Alaska is right here, kind of in central, um, in the center of the state, and the Yukon drainage drains down into the uh, or the Tanama drainage, excuse me, drains into the Yukon River. Um, so the Chena and Sulcher rivers are big, are um, big contributors of salmon to the Tanana drainage. And um, those are really important salmon producers for all the subsistence communities and villages downstream um, that harvest those salmon later in the year. And then the Yukon River Basin is, is an especially interesting fishery and important fishery, not only because of these subsistence um, uses all along the river in Alaska, but also because the river basin stretches all the way into Canada. It actually crosses international borders. So um, there's, there's a variety of, of international agreements and treaties that need to be made uh, like one example where U.S. Fish and Wildlife is involved that need to be made to order this, um, to maintain um, viability of the stock and uh, ensure that we have enough escapement up into Canada. So there's a lot of potential causes for this decline. Um, 
and I'm not going to go into all of them, but Elodia is one in interior Alaska that's, that's a cause for concern. That's an invasive, in uh, in invasive aquatic plant, um, which is pretty destructive to fish habitat. They believe uh, that it got introduced to the Badger Slough area around 2009, 2010. Um, they think it was by somebody dumping their fish tank into the Badger Slough. Uh, Elodia is a popular plant for people to have in fish tanks. And so, so that's the theory of how it got introduced to interior. But um, basically once it gets into, introduced into a natural environment, it, it grows really aggressively and chokes out all um, native plant life, it chokes out all fish habitat. It's, it's pretty destructive to environment. It can also have some major effects on, on river flows. And any of you guys have, who have ever walked through Badger Slough, especially kind of in late summer when those blooms really start to get big, um, you'll definitely see that, that Elodia plant in there. There is eradication projects going on. Um, they're using uh, chemical herbicides to, to try to kill that plant. I don't know how successful those have been, but the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District has been pretty aggressive in, in applications of those in recent years. Uh, another concern um, for salmon uh, in the Chena River specifically is temperature. So um, downtown Chena, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed when when driving um, through downtown that there's a section of the Chena River that doesn't freeze over the winter and you often see steam rolling off of it when it's um, warm outside and that's actually from water that's being piped um, from the power plant. They use that uh, river water to cool the power plant and they pump it directly back into the water. So um, I read up a little bit, there wasn't a ton of public info on this, but um, as, as far as I can tell, they said they've had studies that um, looked at the, the temperature effects from this power plant and, and they say that they don't affect fish species. Um, I couldn't get really any other details than that, but um, that heat pollution within that lower main stem river is definitely a concern because it affects juvenile salmon, it affects adult salmon that are migrating up through the river, and it definitely affects other fish species that are in that area. Um, there's definitely con uh, concerns for climate change um, in this area and across all of Alaska. There's been a lot of research on that. And then uh, the disease ichthyophonus is a disease that adult Chinook salmon um, get and in it increases their mortality as they're swimming back up river and it can also um, reduce the success rate of hatching eggs. Uh, the the news on that, the um, media on that has kind of decreased in recent years. I don't know a ton about it personally, so, um, but know that that is out there and that it's, that it's an issue as well. One of the biggest factors um, for the salmon decline seems to be at sea factors. So for example, ocean temperatures, um, available forage in the ocean, how much competition from other species there is, how much predation in the ocean there is of adult salmon, um, and then bycatch is a big one. There's no commercial fisheries of Chinook salmon in um, Norton Sound, which is the exit of the Yukon River, um, but there are commercial fisheries for other types of salmon, and there is bycatch from that. So there is some commercial harvest, and um, that definitely has an impact on the overall fishery. Uh, but one of the very important parts of, of salmon habitat or, or salmon life history is, is its freshwater habitat. While it's rearing and while it's a juven in its juvenile life stage as, a, as just a two or three inch long fish. And that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today. And that's really the type of habitat that the Chena River and the Salter River interior Alaska provides for these fish. So kind of the management response to um, the salmon decline has been pretty widespread. Uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game has done a variety of traditional approaches. Uh, of course, they do escapement surveys where they run like a fish weir. They do carcass surveys and otolith um, research. They do juvenile abundance surveys um, throughout the Chena and other rivers and um, up statewide as well. Um, they have, they, the regulations for sport fishing haven't been changed since actually the 1960s um, for Chinook salmon in the Tanana River drainage. But in recent years, they have um, put out emergency orders that uh, restrict harvest or to catch and release only or close the fishery altogether. I think last year they closed it for all salmon species um, for, for no fishing in the Tanana River drainage. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife does some habitat restorations. They replace culverts and stream bank. They also do outreach and education, um, and that's what we're going to talk about later today. And then UAF definitely does a lot of research on a lot of different fish species outside of salmon, and they do habitat and hydrology and weather surveys and all sorts of different stuff. And we could just talk for weeks and weeks about all of their research projects that are going on. Um, and then 
one of the one of the things that I'd like to highlight here today is the Ten Law Valley Watershed Association. Um, and so they're a non-governmental organization, they're a nonprofit, and, and their goal is basically to promote healthy watershed management um, in the Chena River and in interior Alaska. So um, in 2015, and they've come out with a couple updated copies, they, they designed a watershed resources action plan, um, which is basically a design for best management practices and um, what areas are in need of conservation efforts in the Chena River drainage. So um, in order to do this, they worked with a lot of different agencies. You can see over here some of those agencies that I mentioned earlier. Um, they worked with a lot of different agencies and developed a plan of, of simple um, goals for managing the Chena River uh, drainage. So that includes no net loss of stream bank habitat, which we're going to discuss here um, with one of my case studies. Um, they want to reduce hard um, stream bank material like cars and concrete and replace it with large woody debris and vegetated areas. Um, they're hoping to restore connectivity for juvenile and, and adult fish, especially anadromous species like salmon. Uh, they want to ensure that the Chena River meets water quality standards by, set by the Alaska Department of Conservation. Um, and they want to achieve no net loss of sloughs and wetlands in both the upper and lower Chena River watershed and restore these wetlands to function naturally. Um, there was some some research that came out recently in 2018 that shows that um, Chinook salmon, juvenile um, Chinook salmon use wetlands and off channel habitat pretty aggressively um, during high flows and, and high temperatures. So you can see that their plan was pretty actually pretty detailed. They have a couple different documents on it. They have information on their website. And I, I don't want to dive too much into the de um, their details, but it definitely encompasses a lot of things, landscape conditions, disturbance regimes, geomorphology, how a river changes over time, um, ecological processes, chemical, physical, and biotic processes. Um, so definitely a, a, a great project that they put together and a great goal. Um, within that, they actually designed a geographic information system, a mapping system to identify and prioritize areas in need of conservation. So we actually have these great mapping systems of interior Alaska watersheds that show, well, this is important fish habitat and it's degraded. So this, this would be an area to prioritize um, conservation or restoration efforts. And that's one of the tools that U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been using to um, use their uh, restoration techniques. So here's just a quick video um, from the Tanana Valley Watershed Association. Uh, this describes a little bit about woody debris and, it, and its importance. I think they say it better than I do. So um, I'd just like to share this with you and make sure to let me know that you can hear it. They say you can't step into the same river twice. Rivers are constantly changing in how they look and how they move. Our community of Fairbanks, Alaska has grown up around the Chena River, which is a tributary of the Tanana River and flows into the Yukon River. Many of us enjoy recreating on the Chena, but did you know that it's the second largest spawning grounds for juvenile Chinook from the Yukon River drainage? As soon as these baby salmon break out of their eggs, they rely on woody debris for protection and food. What is woody debris? Woody debris is a collection of fallen tree branches, logs, and roots that form along the riverbank. Jeff Falke, a researcher with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, discovered that about 70% of the woody debris areas along the Chena were occupied by juvenile Chinook. When rivers are allowed to flood naturally, they create these fish forts along corners and other catchments. These areas become an important refuge for salmon. In the early 1900s, it was common for people to try stabilizing stream banks with rigid material like rock, steel, and concrete. As Fairbanks began to grow around the Chena, many of these items were used. You can still see remnants of this era as cars, tires, and scrap metal slowly work their way out of the ground along the Chena River. We now understand that vegetation along the stream bank provides more stabilization with roots acting like anchors for the soil. The purpose of bank hardening was to stop erosion. However, this occurs at the cost of removing natural habitat for fish and wildlife alike. There are many solutions to repairing the damage done to our riverbanks, prevent further erosion, and provide critical habitat for juvenile Chinook. 
These baby salmon are very vulnerable for the first few years of their life as they live and grow in the Chena River while preparing for their long journey to the ocean. Woody debris is critical to their survival. Several partners are working with private and public landowners to create large woody debris like spruce tree piles and large root wads anchored to the banks to slow rivers down and provide these important fish forts. Visit our website to learn more about the importance of woody debris and how you can help become salmon friendly neighbors. Our website is www. Yeah, and there's definitely been some great restorations that have gone on um, from that. If any of you guys have ever floated from uh, Nordale Road, floated the Chena River from Nordale to downtown Fairbanks, you can see a lot of those cars from the 1960s popping out of the riverbank and, and saying hi. They've still got fins on the back. They look like spaceships. It's pretty funny to see what people um, thought would help at the time. And unfortunately, those, those really don't help keep your riverbanks stabilized. So... They say you can't step into the same river twice. So um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been doing a lot of um, restoration efforts to kind of repair this damage that, that they just mentioned. So um, some of the reasons that these areas aren't good for fish habitat, um, like these seawalls or this concrete barriers, um, is a, there's a couple reasons why why they're not good for fish. Um, a big one is temperature. Without any trees or um, or foliage to shade the waterway, there's a, there's a lot more solar radiation that can penetrate the water and um, that really heats up the water. And heat is a really important part of uh, how fish survive. It not only controls the dissolved oxygen in the water and, and how fit they are, how much energy they can expel, but um, it also affects their digestion and growth. So if there's not enough forage available um, and the river temperature is really hot, their, their metabolism actually increases substantially. And if they can't keep up, that can actually show um, higher mortality and um, there's been some cool studies on that from UAF recently as, um, as well. And then these like, for example, the seawall, um, it really speeds up flow in these areas. We call it a channelized area when all the bank is uniform um, and it's in a straight shoot. And we're going to discuss that a little bit too um, in the Cripple Creek restoration project that I talk about later. But this channelization is pretty bad for fish because um, it makes fast flows and makes the river flow faster um, and it doesn't really give small fish any refuge like where this woody debris would be. Um, I think a lot of you guys know since you're fly fishermen you know that the fish like to, to hang out in the wood. They like to hang out um, under the trees. I mean I, I get my fly rods snagged up in those all the time so um, we kind of know already that the fish really like this woody habitat and, and temperature and, and forage and um, protection from predators and flow is a big part of that. So um, to address this issue, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been doing um, restorations over the past, I think, about two decades um, in the Chena River watershed and the um, Salter River as well. Um, so here's just an example over on the left side. This is the Rosehip Campground out on Chena Hot Springs Road. Some of you guys might know this area, but um, this project was um, where the river had eroded the trail um, uh, that was right beside um, the Chena River. So this is like a bike path or, or walking trail and the river had eroded it so bad. Um, and what they were getting, planning on doing is just to replace um, the trail and then dump rocks there, which which we know isn't necessarily an effective technique now. Um, so what U.S. Fish and Wildlife did here and they do in a lot of other areas along the Chena River is um, they use their restoration techniques, which is basically placing root wads down in between the land and the river um, and then tying them together with cables and then covering that in different um, dirt and substrates um, and then planting willows on top. So here is before the restoration up in the top left. And then here is after the restoration is complete. And then down here on the right, lower right, here's um, just one year later. So you can see, um, even just anecdotally, we know that's better fish habitat just by looking at it. I mean, if you guys were um, floating down the river, would you be throwing throwing your fly rod up here at the top in that that deep pool, or would you be looking more towards where that vegetation is, where there's some um, bugs falling into the river? And so we kind of know um, inherently that that's that that's better habitat, but there's also evidence to show that um, fish actually use that. Um, so 
Mitch actually, Mitch Osborne's the wildlife or the habitat restoration biologist at Fish and Wildlife. He's one of the guys that I'm working with on my senior thesis project. And he was um, gracious enough to provide me with uh, some videos that he took of the race restoration efforts. Um, so what they basically do on those river banks is they dig it out all the way down to about the level of the river. Um, and they try to do this during like low river conditions. And then they place these about 12 to 15 foot long um, spruce tree stumps with a root wad on the outside facing towards the river. So those root wads are actually create the new riverbank. And what that does is it catches um, sediment and it catches other um, woody debris and it kind of builds up some armor to protect that um, riverbank from eroding. So you can see here that they're basically placed them all perpendicular to the actual river, river channel. Um, and then what they do after that is they tie them all together with a cable and then they cover them with a couple different layers of um, sediments and, and rock substrates. And then they plant those willows on top. And we've actually got a great time lapse as well of a restoration. So this is that same um, rose, hip, uh, rose Hip Creek path that we were just looking at. Um, it's a little fast, so we might have to play it twice. But so they basically dug out the riverbank, placed all those root wads, and then they tied them all together. And then they have a kind of a recipe where they layer a couple different substrates on top of that. And then they place um, some organic debris or organic materials. And then they plant these willow stems. And those willow stems are about 18 inches to two feet long. And they're just um, a, like a frozen willow stem and they plant them all the way down in the ground. And what happens is those willow stems actually take root and sprout a new plant, even though it looks like they're dead. It just looks like you're push, pushing a bunch of sticks in the ground. It's pretty interesting um, to see those plants and, and see how, um, how successful they are. They, they have a really high success rate for um, how many of those plants take root. Now, one of the downsides to this um, type of restoration is that it's really expensive. It's five to seven hundred dollars per linear foot of river. So a restoration like this could end up at a hundred thousand dollars to a couple hundred thousand. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has thankfully got some money to um, to do these projects, and that's that's with a contractor. It's actually um, Mitch just told me yesterday that that's actually cheaper than placing rock. Now they've they finally got their methods cheaper than placing rocks along the riverbanks, um, which is good. So it's not only cheaper, but it's better for the fish and it's um, better for maintaining riverbanks. Um, and one of the interesting things is that um, Mitch is very supportive of people who are like. DIY people do it yourself and so if you have equipment or you have a friend um, that, that's got a bulldozer or an excavator like this um, he's actually willing to do like a sweat equity match usually he requires some sort of 50 50 match of cost sharing or sweat equity so um, what he'll do is he'll actually cover all the costs if you guys are willing to do the work and and place this yourself and so he works with a lot of um, private landowners and a lot of private property but he also works with um, Fort Wainwright you can see some great examples of this. There's some great examples of these restoration techniques um, right downtown and then on the Salter River as well. So just one more time, that was the before picture. Then they dug it all out, placed those logs. This is the after, and then just one year later. And it honestly, um, I, go ahead. You're gonna say something? Hey, hey, Will, hey, I got well, a quick got a question, question for you. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, all right. All so, right. Do, so they, do they, as, as, far as, as far as them working, them working with, with, with Wayne, Wayne right, right. Um, do they uh, utilize military personnel for that, or um, how, how does that work, do you know? I'm not 100% sure. That'd be a good, great question for Mitch. I was hoping he was going to be here tonight, but it doesn't look like he's able to come in yet. Um, they, as I, I'd expect that they're using engineers and contractors. I don't think that they're using actual labor from any of the, the enlisted soldiers or, or any of that, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll text you some questions, questions afterwards. afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right.
any other questions on that? Oh, and feel free to interrupt me anytime if, if you guys have questions on, on anything. Great. So I guess we'll move on then. So um, to a case study is, which is the Cripple Creek Restoration Project. And um, US Fish and Wildlife has been heavily involved in this project too. Um, and this is what my senior thesis is um, focusing on is for my last year at, at UAF and definitely been an interesting project over the past couple of years and, and a pretty fascinating study and very close to town. So for those of you who don't know about the Cripple Creek watershed, you can see over here on the right, this is the entire Chena um, Chena River watershed, and you can see Fairbanks here, and then Chena Hot Springs Road kind of or kind of follows the main stem um, up, and then you see Chena Hot Springs right there. And and Cripple Creek is just this weird little fan watershed off of the very western um, side. And um, for any of you guys who live in town or know Fairbanks very well, um, this channel here is right off of Chena Pump Road. You can actually walk right to it right from the road, and um, then the Parks Highway actually bisects some of these other river channels. Um, like Esther Creek and Happy Creek here. So um, it's right in the middle of town. There's neighborhoods in these areas. Um, there's parks and there's public land in these areas. It's a pretty cool area to check out, um, which is right close to town too. But um, essentially what this project was, was a restoration of redirecting a um, drainage ditch created by miners to back into the original channel. So back in the 1930s, around 1935, there was a placer mining operation going on in the upper watershed um, of Cripple Creek. And in order to facilitate that those operations, basically what they were doing was using a high pressure water hose to blast away overburden um, and get to the gold bearing gravel and, and materials. And in order to let all of their um, their water and um, overburden flow away, um, the, the Cripple Creek um, channel was originally what they used, which you can see the original channel here is light blue in this map. And you can see it's got a lot of meanders. What that, what each of those little twists and turns does is actually slows down the river's travel. Um, and then some sediment can build up in each of those turns and it kind of gets choked up. So what the miners did um, was build a drainage ditch right parallel to that. And then they diverted water out of the creek and um, you started using this drainage ditch to drain all of their sediment and water in straight into the Chena River. So um, back in the 1930s and there was no reclamation, there was no fish habitat permits or anything like that. So they could basically do what they want. And we'll discuss that a little bit later with the, um, some of the culverts that they installed and what they did. But um, essentially what US Fish and Wildlife uh, wanted to do was uh, reconnect this creek back in or re redirect the water back into the original creek bed um, and reconnect these barriers to fish passage. So you can see here, this is Chena Spur Road. Um, and previously there was no culverts under there so that there, those channels were not connected. Um, and then Chena Ridge Road, there was uh, no culverts as well. So um, they had a couple culvert replacements and some retrofitting in this area. And they also did some, some habitat work, which we'll discuss here in a second. Um, the bulk of this restoration was uh, occurred on um, Interior Alaska Land Trust land, which is a nonprofit organization that owns land um, and, and manages it in a way for public use. So for recreation like ski trails and ATV trails. And um, so it's, it's kind of a nice area, kind of a nice little refuge for people right in the middle of Fairbanks too. Um, but they just completed this project this fall uh, in August or September 2020 and, and water is now directed back through this uh, Happy Creek channel and is flowing through the original creek bed again. So we're kind of expecting this spring for um, a, a big blowout, a lot of sediment and stuff to, to get cleared out with that spring spring rush of water. Um, and then after that, they'll um, continue doing some research in the area to find out how effective their restoration was. So basically, um, this is right below Chena Pump Road. And this is kind of what we're trying to avoid up in the upper left here. Um, this raging water, this 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 was this spring, I took that photo. And um, that's, that's pretty impassable for fish species, a fast slope, um, kind of a canyon shape, um, 
fast water and no relief, no relief for small fish species. And that that's kind of preventing um, even, even medium-sized fish like a grayling to enter this habitat and access these areas. So um, US Fish and Wildlife by redirecting the water into that um, original creek bed is gonna slow the water down and also allow for, um, for more exchange with the groundwater and uh, areas. And then the culverts are also going to help slow that water down and improve fish passage. So um, you can see here in the upper right, one of the actions that they did was they kind of dumped some large woody debris into the ri that river. You can see some of the trees um, that got dumped into the river to help slow flow. This is a pretty um, high water event right now. I think I took this photo at the same time, but this is right below one of the retrofitted culverts that they had. And uh, you can see it's definitely quite an improvement and um, that this area isn't necessarily channelized anymore. And that this area has um, really variable habitat on the bottom. So different depths, different size substrates, um, eddies and pools and riffles and fly fishermen know that because we know that we need to hit seam lines to catch fish and we know that um, grayling are often better caught in a, like a riffle area. So by creating some of this habitat in the areas surrounding the culverts, it kind of allows um, each fish species to find their own niche habitat. And then these two photos on the bottom, you can see this is actually the drainage ditch um, that the miners created that has just over the years uh, evolved. This culvert here you can see um, was done in 2002, uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, when they redid that intersection. This is right, be uh, right behind uh, just a store off China Pump Road. And um, you can go look at this culvert if you'd like to. But um, so this was redone in 2002 on the channel. But um, what US Fish and Wildlife actually did in this location um, is they redirected water from here through this little um, side channel. And then that's actually where um, it'll be draining into uh, the original channel again, along with Happy Creek. So this is one of the culverts that they had to retrofit. This is kind of what we're trying to avoid. Um, I think this is two fuel tanks welded together and then they had a road built on top of that. So definitely some Alaska style ingenuity and, um, and it might've got the job done in the day, but, but not ideal for fish habitat. And um, this is basically everything we're trying to avoid. It's straight. Um, which makes fast water and it's a smooth surface. Um, there's a roughness coefficient that you can calculate and, and metal is a very smooth surface which allows water to travel fast. Um, and it's also a long stretch. This is a pretty long culvert. Um, and so a small fish, even if it could make it say halfway through, it, it's gonna have uh, trouble making it all the way through a culvert like that. Um, and then this on the right, you can see the, the other side of that culvert and that's during a high flow um, event Actually, there was a beaver dam built right um, in this uh, last time I looked at it. So uh, I'm not sure how the fish passage is there currently, but um, during a, like a high flow event with a small diameter culvert like this is, is not ideal for fish passage because you can, um, you, you know that water is just raging through there and not allowing fish to, um, to move through there with, um, with any ease. So, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has uh, all sorts of methods and protocols for um, designing fish, what, what we call fish-friendly culverts. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but basically what they want to do is allow, slow the water down um, and make the habitat within the culverts variable and allow um, little refuge habitats, little areas for the fish to rest as they're making their way through. So you can see um, here on the right, there's actually a constructed channel within this culvert. This is a, a really wide culvert, maybe 16 to 18 feet. And there's actually a channel that they constructed in here that meanders back and forth and actually winds back and forth. And it looks kind of like a natural riverbed. You know, that's what we see when we're out, um, out on the water. And that's, that's good for fish because on low flows like this, it's, it slows it down and it creates um, heterogeneity in the habitat and um, variability. And then there's also for, for each of these culvert restorations, there's also kind of a recipe for um, what you create this channel out of. So it's pretty interesting. Say there's like 15% boulders, um, you need 15% cobbles, you need 15% large gravel, um, and then you need this much uh, coarse sand and this much fine silt. So they have a little recipe 
uh, for each culvert about how to how to create this. But basically, they just these big boulders allow fish to um, move in between uh, areas with rest. So they'll work really hard to get through this fast current in the middle, and then they'll be able to rest behind a rock or in a shallower area. And then another thing that I'm not sure how often it's it's applied. It, it was on Chena Spur Road. You can go and see this too if you drive over there. It's, it's pretty interesting to take a look at. Um, but one of the goals is to try to not restrict rivers from moving within their natural floodplain. So typically over time, an, an undeveloped river, an under, unrestricted river um, will actually move back and forth within an area. And that's that's actually what we're seeing when the Chena River is eroding the bank on your property. Um, it's it's just doing its its natural movement and its natural meandering over time. And uh, the only reason it's an issue is because it's it's eroding your expensive riverfront property. And um, but especially in small streams like this, we're able to kind of compensate for that a little bit by building multiple culverts. So on Chena Spur Road, you can see. Um, they have one large culvert in the middle that looks kind of like this picture on the right, and then they have a couple more small culverts. And what this allows is for during like a flood stage, say like a hundred year flood um, or other high water, or if the river just changes the course of its channel, it allows it to move over time um, and unrestricted. And, and it allows the minimal human impact on the river possible. And this not only makes a better culvert for fish and, and hydrology and geomorphology, but it also improves the vitality of the culvert. It makes it last longer. It makes us have to replace them less often because um, it, it allows the river to move naturally back and forth. So kind of a, a all around in the in the long term, it's that's a, a great building technique. And these are always constantly changing. And um, but these are kind of best management practices that are, are widely accepted. Um, so there's been uh, three culvert replacements on Cripple, well, I guess two culvert replacements uh, and a retrofit. They retrofitted that um, fuel tank culvert that I showed earlier because they couldn't replace that one. Um, they What they did was they put vertical baffles in and they put rock in and they tried to make it as variable as they could. Um, and then you can see, so these are some of the other culverts. So this is at Chena Spur Road. Um, and then this is, or I'm sorry, this is at Chena Ridge Road here in the middle. And then this is at Chena Spur Road. That's what I was mentioning. They had multiple culverts so the river can move back and forth. And, and they just recently completed this. Um, it's definitely pretty interesting. If you guys would like to go take a look, it's you, you just park on the road and hike on down there and you can see right, right in the river channel, you can see that constructed channel. And it's definitely better for fish habitat. It'll be interesting to see what it looks like next spring once the water kind of blows out. Um, this river channel hasn't had real flow in it for over 80 years, maybe 100 years almost, but so it'll be interesting to see how it adapts over time and and how that that big pause in in um, flow has has changed that channel. And then one of the other things that they did in this restoration was in all the areas surrounding uh, the re the restored culverts, they planted willows, just the same exact method as their stream bank rest, uh, restorations, where they plant the willow stems beneath and let them take root. And that basically just stabilized this um, uh, this river bank. It creates, it'll create shade and um, it'll be interesting to see how it all grows up and how it all, um, because it's such a recent restoration, it'll be interesting to see how it changes. And so overall, this project was intended to promote healthy riparian areas and um, they wanted to promote natural structure and stream characteristics in the channels. They wanted to allow for connectivity of the river systems for fish um, and, high, and, uh, and water. And they wanted to create diverse habitat for fish and other species. And that habitat diversity is very important. We, there's a lot of research that suggests that more diverse fish communities and um, more diverse habitat uh, allows for more resilient populations, populations that can withstand more disturbances like floods um, or human development. So that maintaining that habitat diversity is, is a really important aspect of, um, manage, of watershed management. And you can kind of tell um, that all of these restoration goals align really well with the um, Tanama Valley Watershed Association Watershed Resources Action Plan objectives. So that's basic um, fishing. Uh, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is basically 
taking that um, that book of the Tanana Valley Watershed Association made and saying, well, this is what we need to do, and they're applying it to each of their projects. It's 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 a pretty good system, and um, we're definitely grateful for all of their support. Um, and then, yeah, one of the other things I wanted to mention, it maintains natural refugia for um, wildlife, fish, and people. There's definitely some cool ski trails and ATV trails in that area. So if you haven't ever explored there, it's kind of a, a nice little wilderness patch in the middle of Fairbanks, and it's really quiet. So if you haven't ever explored in that area, I'd, I'd recommend you go. It's just right off of Chena Pump Road, and I'd recommend you go explore that area and check this out a little bit. So throughout this whole restoration process, um, the Fairbanks Youth for Habitat Corps has um, collected uh, minnow trapping samples um, and op operated these fish traps um, throughout uh, the entire creek system that, that they're looking at restoring. So um, <clears throat> you can see the distribution of all the sites here, uh, both on the original channel and the um, drainage ditch. Um, but basically the Fairbanks Youth for Habitat Corps, they are a youth, uh, like a kid's camp um, that's supervised by the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District. They've, um, for the past couple summers, been operating these minnow traps and, and collecting fish data. And this summer I went out um, and worked with them a little bit. I kind of helped fill in some of the data gaps um, when they took a couple weeks off throughout the summer. And um, from that, I, I was able to kind of develop a senior thesis research project. So this is what um, my project will, will focus on is, is analyzing the minnow trap data from this area, and we definitely caught some cool fish. The, there's there's some cool species utilizing this um, system. You can see up here uh, in the top that's a juvenile Arctic grayling. Um, we see a, a northern pike here. That was that guy was pretty aggressive. Um, he didn't want to be stuck in that trap for too long. There's a, a slimy sculpin here in the middle, um, and then this this little guy in the bottom. That's a juvenile Chinook salmon, and um, he's a pretty unique fish. I, I wanted to make sure to mention him because uh, we caught him all the way up at site 16 here, up uh, uh, up at Happy Creek, and that's the farthest up in the river system a, Chinook, a juvenile Chinook salmon's ever been recorded. Um, so definitely pretty exciting to see um, not only uh, juvenile salmon all the way up up in the watershed, but also such a large, healthy juvenile Chinook salmon. It looked like he was just about to smolt and and head south uh, head south down the river and but it was definitely encouraging to see the fish all the way up at the watershed. So um, a lot of this restoration efforts kind of intended to um, enhance uh, off-channel habitat for salmon species. Um, we don't yet know how much of an effect it's gonna have, but it's definitely encouraging to see that guy who's been able to use these new culverts and travel all the way up. So I, uh, I just heard that we've got funding for the project and, and my proposal was accepted. And so great news for that. So um, I don't have any data analysis yet, any true results, but um, what we'll be looking at is changes over time, like in fish abundance and um, fish length. We'll see uh, if, if the size of fish changed over the years or, or how many fish are, were actually using that creek system. Um, we're going to look at the uh, distribution of fish and kind of uh, assess how much the barriers to fish passage, those old culverts affected the fish pre-restoration. And then we're also going to take a look at the effects of stream temperature and discharge from the Chena River main stem channel. Um, and there's been some interesting research uh, in the Chena River that shows, like I said, that um, Chinook salmon juveniles use off-channel habitat um, at a higher rate during high temperatures uh, and high flows in the Chena River main stem. So we're kind of going to see if that carries through for this project, and um, it should be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, like I said, we don't have a ton of preliminary results, um, but something notable that we found was a, a two-fold increase in fish abundance between 2018 and 2019, and that was right after one of the culvert replacements. So we can't yet attribute that to the restoration. Um, we kind of have to do some more analysis, but it's pretty interesting and, and good to see that um, the fish have increased uh, so dramatically recently. And then, of course, I mentioned that observation of juvenile Chinook salmon. It's not necessarily um, statistically significant, but um, definitely an exciting, it's, it's exciting to see such a, um, that, I mean, that's, that's the whole goal of the restoration. So it's exciting to see at least some success there. Any questions on that?
And by the way, we were talking about Byers Lake earlier. This is a, I caught this one by accident in Byers Lake. That was one of the only fish we, we pulled out of that trip. <laughs> Okay, well, if no questions, then we'll move on. Um, so I wanted to tell you too about one of the other projects uh, that I was able to work on this summer. And um, this is kind of uh, also in reference to um, the, the habitat research that we talked about earlier and, and how that's an important part of, of salmon recruitment. Um, so this was a project that I worked on with UAF. We definitely used, we spent the summer um, jet boating around up in the upper Chena River and we used some pack rafts to access sampling sites and um, go play with play with these juvenile fish. Here's our, our little work dog did a pretty good job of staying in the boat the whole time. Um, but so this project was assessing uh, the effect of wildfires on fish habitat. So kind of the, the basic idea for the study stems from the network dynamic hypothesis, which basically says that um, tributaries are important contributors of ecological, biological, um, and physical resources to a river. Um, so in simple terms, stuff flows out of tributaries. And I think um, fishermen kind of know this, you know, if we're ever chasing a, a predatory fish, especially like a pike or a burbot or um, a she fish or even salmon, a lot of the times we'll target these confluences of, of tributaries and main stem channels because we know they're productive. And um, so just know that next time somebody somebody's arguing about which spot to fish in that um, you have science to back you up that confluence is a be better spot. Um, but basically with that idea that um, these tributaries contribute a, a lot of um, nutrients to the river, it creates these biological hotspots, these ecological hotspots with more primary productivity, um, a higher abundance of invertebrates, more bugs, um, and then also more diverse fish communities. So the, the hypothesis for this study um, was, does wildfire in tributaries affect macroinvertebrates and, um, and turbidity in the river? Uh, and do those in turn affect Chinook salmon species? So um, they had a pretty unique opportunity last year. If you guys don't remember, we had some pretty severe fires, a pretty severe fire season. And um, there was two large fires up on the Chena River uh, watershed. So um, Eric Shane, the principal investigator for this study, um, basically designed uh, the study to look at tributaries that were burned from that forest fire and tributaries that were unburned. And um, they wanted to kind of quantify how substantial the contributions um, from those burned tributaries were, how big is that difference? So kind of some of the hypotheses going in was that warmer water temperatures could negatively or positively affect Chinook salmon. Um, reduced water clarity can do the same negatively or positively affect Chinook. Um, more invertebrate food is, is usually a good thing. Uh, and then more distracting debris can be a bad thing because the fish will chase wood or, and, and leaves and, and stuff that's not food and use up their energy. Um, and these fish need to grow really, really fast. So um, if efficient feeding activities are really important to them. So basically um, what this project included was um, setting up these little catchment devices on these small tributaries. So it's basically just a PVC pipe with um, sandbags and we created a, just a little barrier to get enough water flow through. Um, and we set up these mesh bags um, on the end of the pipe. We had two bags, one inside of the other. Um, one's like a coarse, mat, a coarse mesh and the other's like a really fine mesh to catch anything under one millimeter. Um, and, and we sampled tributaries from burned areas and unburned areas. And basically we let these run for 24 hours and let them fill up with um, invertebrates and woody debris and leaves and anything that was flowing down the stream. Uh, and, and then after 24 hours, we came back and collected them. And then we brought those back to the lab and, and cleaned up all our data. And we actually counted each individual um, each individual and bug species. And I, we identified each one. and we identified woody debris and, and weighed it all up. Um, and then to relate that to the main stem, Chena River, uh, we use this, what's called a precision invertebrate sampler, which is basically just a water pump um, that pumps the main stem Chena River water up into this tank and then it drains down and it drains through the exact same two mesh, um, 
uh, two mesh bags, the exact same, I think five millimeter and one millimeter. Um, and we would run that for an hour at a time. And um, basically just to see if below the tributaries had more debris or more invertebrates uh, than above. It looks like we got a question here. Uh, are there baseline data from pre-fire uh, from the same hotspot zones in the tributaries of the Upper Chena? Yeah, um, I was actually just going to discuss that. I don't know if there is um, baseline data specifically for this project, but um, this invertebrate sampling device is actually um, part of a larger project, um, which is uh, being operated by South Fork Research. Um, Jason Newswanger is a pretty well-known scientist around here, and he's kind of a mad scientist with some of the things that he creates. So they're doing a longer-term study on Chinook forage um, and how temperature and um, different factors can affect Chinook recruitment, juvenile Chinook size. Um, so for this study, we actually kind of partnered research crews and, and we shared techs and we shared equipment and shared effort so that we actually had to use less people to go out and gather this data. And then they're going to kind of take the data and break it apart into a couple different studies and, um, and, and hopefully come out with some useful information. Uh, and then one more thing that I didn't have a picture of um, that Jason also has to get credit for um, was his uh, imaging unit. He basically built a custom um, imaging device with, with a camera integrated and a computer system integrated into it um, that would take pictures of for, of um, drift that was floating by in the river. And then later back at the lab, they could take those photos of invertebrates and woody debris, et cetera, um, and classify them and use those photos to kind of truth this data and see how much it varied and see how accurate our, our methods were. This whole machine and, and these, these methods are kind of an attempt to become more precise in um, our measuring of invertebrate drift and woody debris because it can be a challenge at times um, to get accurate results that are representative of the whole river. So after we collected the um, forage and, and drift data, um, the next step was to do habitat surveys. So we did a habitat survey um, for each of the tributaries that we sampled and we did that, I think we did one a month um, typically throughout the year to kind of capture the seasonality of each tributary. So you can see um, Elizabeth up here doing some, some foliage surveys. And I think she's actually doing a very similar project except on grayling around interior Alaska instead of Chinook salmon. And you can see Ben here, he's rivering, uh, he's measuring a river transect to, for doing um, foliage surveys. And um, basically it's, it's a pretty simple process actually to do those vegetation surveys. We have what's called a densiometer, which sounds like a very fancy scientific instrument, but it's basically just a disco ball. Um, it's, it's a dome shaped mirror with a grid shape painted on it or, or carved into it. And you basically stand in the river channel and you look in, in that mirror and you count the squares that have foliage in them. And that kind of gives you an estimate of uh, how dense the foliage above the stream is. So that's, our, our idea with that is kind of to, um, I mean, you'd expect the burned areas to have less dense foliage because it's just all burned the previous year. So um, that's kind of one of the uh, factors that we that we wanted to include with was the habitat surveys. And then, of course, we had to relate this to actual fish species. So um, we ran minnow traps. These are actually the same minnow traps uh, as in Cripple Creek. You can see down here in the middle, that's the exact same thing that the Youth for Habitat Corps is running. Um, but we basically accessed a bunch of sampling sites um, with jet boats and pack rafts and et cetera, and um, gathered Chinook salmon data throughout the summer. And this was mostly to um, capture the length and weight of the Chinook. We're trying to capture growth and use that to compare differences between um, tributaries that were burned and tributaries that were unburned. Um, so that was definitely a cool process and, and it was great to see some of these fish. Uh, we saw some very cool critters and it was um, it was very fun to see how abundant these fish were. Some, some days we caught, uh, I think we caught 270 Chinook salmon one day and just three traps at one site. Um, so it was, it was pretty encouraging actually how abundant these fish were uh, in the upper Chena drainage, especially once you see that scary graph um, at the front of our, our presentation that shows that Chinook salmon abundance is declining. It's uh, kind of reassuring 
how many of these healthy little fish are out there. Um, and we caught other critters um, in our minnow traps as well. You can see a, an Arctic lamprey over here and you can see a Northern pike on the other side and a, another slimy sculpin. These photos at the top show some of the invertebrates and, um, and woody debris and distracting drift that, that we caught in those drift nets. Um, definitely an interesting study and um, pretty fun to go out and play with these fish, especially on the nice warm sunny days that uh, I feel lucky to have that job. So I was just talking to Eric recently and, and he gave me a little bit of um, preliminary results. They don't really have anything super solid yet, but um, what their data is showing now is that the burned tributaries had warmer water temperatures and more debris than the unburned tributaries, which is kind of to be expected because they have um, less soil and less um, less foliage on top of the soil and less, you know, all the trees just got burned. We'd expect that sun to warm up the the water more and um, more runoff from the soil of those burned areas. And then he, he found that the main stem channel had more debris and was slightly warmer than the burned areas. And that's kind of to be expected um, as well. I don't know if that was a significant difference. Um, he hasn't been able to analyze that yet, but, and you can see over here that we've tracked um, fish growth throughout the summer. Um, and that was just taken from large samples. And um, we didn't see necessarily a, a significant difference between um, the growth of Chinook salmon above and below uh, the burn tributaries. But over the winter, Eric's going to be continuing to go through the data analysis process. He's going to be doing running some statistics and some models to um, figure out uh, exactly what the results show. And then kind of the interesting next step for this study is going to be developing a drone imaging assessment method for these burned watersheds. So kind of the intent going into the study is to be able to use drone images um, to predict the effects on, of forest fires on fish habitat. So hopefully we'll be able to use this data to kind of extrapolate out and predict what, what effects forest fires might have on fish habitat in the future. So that's pretty cool. Um, I'm not necessarily involved in, in the analysis of this project. I was just a field tech this summer, and um, but I wanted to uh, make sure to show you guys this and I thought it was a pretty interesting project. So why should fishermen care about any of these numbers and, and anything? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to say that we are the conservationists. You know, it always starts um, with the people. And I think, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, in the very beginning of the presentation, that um, Alaskans especially get, get a very important say in how our resources are managed. And um, we should take advantage of that. And we should be able, we should be able to utilize that. Um, so being able to spread the knowledge and, and being open to learning in the future, being keeping an eye out for, for more information coming in. Science is very um, dynamic. It's, it's constantly changing. So being remembering that and, and being open to learn all this new information and some of these new studies coming out can be very helpful. And you really don't need to be an expert to, to kind of spread some of these ideas and, and discuss, you know, if you're floating the Chena River with your family and you can t uh, explain to them why um, those those woody riverbanks are actually better for fish species and, and better for the property owner um, than the cars that are hanging out of the riverbank. So uh, I definitely ask you guys to do that. And and we do that with our kids camp. And we I think this organization does a great job. And there's always always kids that are very successful in fly fishing and conservation from that. Um, and, and even if you don't care about any of that other stuff, even if you don't care about conservation or sustainable fisheries, um, I think you should care about Chinook salmon in the Chena River drainage because they are keystone species. They affect other, organis other organisms. So um, grayling especially feed a lot on juvenile Chinook salmon egg or on Chinook salmon eggs and uh, adult flesh. Um, so if you like big grayling, then you should like abundant salmon as well. And, and it's all in all part of an ecosystem. So um, by having abundant salmon, those are bringing a lot of marine derived nutrients and, and supporting our local fisheries that we like. So yeah, just remember that conservation starts with you. It, it doesn't take much to have a conversation about this while you're out, out on the river. And um, so I'll ask you to take somebody fishing and, and show them the ropes and um, tell them just a little about, about good fish handling and um, kind of habitat conservation in the Chena River. And um, 
if you're looking to, to somehow donate financially, I think buying a fishing license is a great way to do that or like a parking permit for the Alaska State Parks. Fishing and hunting licenses go directly into conservation funding for, for research and, and conservation of those species. That directly funds fishing game projects. And fishing games actually hurting pretty bad right now because all there's been no tourists this year because of the coronavirus. So um, if you're looking to make a donation to support some of these conservation activities, um, I'd, I'd suggest that you buy a fishing license license and not only buy one for yourself but maybe your friends and family and significant other and kids and grandkids and um, and that's one way that you can support some of this research and then another interesting way that you can actually contribute is by buying fishing gear um, so the Pittman Robertson Act uh, and the Dingle Johnson Act are taxes on hunting uh, and uh, hunting gear and ammunition and fishing gear for the Dingle Johnson Act. Um, so those taxes um, actually go back into um, conservation and management. I think the Dingle Johnson Act official name is the um, Sport Fish Wildlife Restoration Fund. So that funds projects like these stream bank restorations. So next time somebody's yelling at you for buying too much fishing gear and spending too much money, just tell them that how many fish species you're saving out on the river um, by buying that new able reel. Um, and then I put a couple links uh, from the TVA, uh, TVWA um, website, the Interior Alaska Land Trust. They've got some great information on Cripple Creek if you'd like to read up on that more. Uh, and then the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District. If you have any kids uh, in that age group, I think it's like 14 and 15 um, or 14 to 16 is their age group. They go out and do a lot of cool projects throughout the summer with that Fairbanks Youth for Habitat Corps. They do all sorts of restoration activities. Um, like I said, they do the minnow trapping in Cripple Creek. They're going to continue that for a couple more years, but um, they do a lot for the restoration projects. And then, um, of course, our kids camp is, is a great event each year. Those, those kids, for those of you who don't know, um, those kids learn fly casting, they learn fly tying, and we also have an entomology, kind of a science section where they learn about the bugs in the water and they learn a little bit of ecology. So, um, yeah, any of those organizations that you can support. And if if you don't think that any of that's the right fit for you to support, I encourage you to go out and, and find your own or, or make your own. Um, there's there's plenty of need and there's plenty of youth and adults who are interested in learning how to fly fish and are interested in getting more in, involved. So I definitely um, recommend that, that any of you guys pursue that if you're interested. So with that, I'll feel free to answer any more questions. Um, and then we can wrap it up. And I left my email there for any of you guys who'd like to get in contact. Very nice, Will, thank you. Yeah, Will, uh, nice job, thanks a lot. Loved it, man, good job. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we could just talk and talk about this forever. There's there's literally weeks and weeks worth of, of activities and projects and, and agency work going on here in, in interior Alaska. So um, this was kind of just a, a little peek into it, um, but hopefully, and also feel free to, if you guys um, own any like riverfront property or know anybody that does and, and you see some of that degraded habitat, um, Mitch is totally willing to um, work with you guys and and try to try to repair that um, stream bank habitat. So feel free to get in contact with me, and I can get you his um, contact info. And because um, because he's definitely gung ho to get those restoration projects going still um, in the Chena River and, and other interior rivers. I think I know some of those on the this halter was just upstream of the bridge. The cabin that was almost overhanging the river with a for sale sign on it. Buy it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a it's mutually beneficial because that's I mean, riverfront property is expensive, and and you buy that, and the river just starts eroding away your dollars, and um, so it's it's good that we've been able to find a way that's um, both both financially um, uh, productive and uh, healthy for the environment to to kind of save all these houses that are starting to fall into the river now. And in in Alaska, are there other rivers besides the Chena? You know, I know they do a little bit on the Salcha. Um, where restoration is occurring that you know um i don't know of anything i'm sure there's out it's out there uh like i said some of the sloughs like badger slough um they're doing some restoration activities a lot of that is elodia treatment 
Um, I know Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District is doing treatment for Elodia up in the Talavana drainage uh, up near Minto Flats. It's, it's getting pretty bad up there as well. So they're treating that with a, with a chemical herbicide and um, hopefully it's been effective. I haven't heard too much um, about those treatments. Uh, I think the bulk of like stream bank restorations and culvert projects are in the Chena River um, and Sulcher River drainages. I think one of the reasons for that is just because the Chena River has the, been the one that's seen the most impacts from um, human development and, and historical degradation. But um, the Chattanooga River has definitely also been mined out. Um, so there's, there's impacts of that up there. And the Chattanooga River holds salmon as well. Um, I think there's a mine near the Good Pasture River, and um, I believe that holds sam Chinook salmon as well. So um, there's definitely kind of an endless list of, of projects to, to go. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe next on the list, now that the Cripple Creek project is completed, I think they're going to be looking at doing culvert replacements in the upper Chena River. Um, if any of you guys have ever driven out, you know, past kind of road rose hip campground and in, in the 30 mile area between 34 mile and 40 mile, there's some big ponds and out by flat flat creek and um, those areas are actually oxbow lakes lakes that used to be connected to the river so i think the next project on the list um, over the next decade or so is to get um, those lakes reconnected with similar culverts for um, juvenile chinook salmon and, and maybe chum salmon spawning and yeah. cool yeah i was thinking that that nico would probably be a Good target for restoration but i don't think there's much of a chinook run there if, if any um i think there's a few but that's probably why there's not as much you know targeted restoration up there but obviously there's tons of historical mining and you can still see the the channelized creeks and all the dredge piles and stuff if you drive up there yeah yeah the upper uh Kina could potentially open up a, a lot of additional habitat if they can connect all those oxbows Right. Very cool. All right. Well, All right. No other um, questions for Will. I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. And of course, you can always contact him afterwards. Um, you know, he's got his email up there. If anybody wants to to give him a, um, a email, um, so Will, I'm gonna ask you to. I'm just gonna share my screen. Put our announcements back up here. For yep things coming up and before we close out you guys see that again yep okay yep so just um so again thanks a lot will and we recorded this so i will post the link to will's presentation um and really appreciate you going through all this will i learned quite a bit that uh, was great so um, just remember um, the, the ugly sweater fly tying night with trot unlimited december 21st check it out if you're interested um, and keep in mind the, uh, the kids camp, um, coming up this summer. If you know a kid that's that, that age that wants to learn how to fly fish and also keep in mind our January meeting talking about New Zealand fishing. Um, so with that, I'll just open it up one last time. If anybody, um, has anything else and, uh, we'll go ahead and close out the meeting. Uh, yeah, this is Fred. I've got a quick question for Will. Um, I didn't realize that Jason was still around town. I, he, does he live here now or is he just come in to do some work or, or what? I'm pretty sure he lives down in Washington. Um, and okay. I think he just comes up during the summers. It, he wasn't up a lot this summer. I think he came up and kind of got that study started, um, this summer. And then I think he's back down in Washington. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I think he got tired of the winters, but <laughs> Um, yeah, I think he's down in somewhere in Washington now. Yeah, he's okay. Still, still involved at, a little uh, bit. He was at University of Georgia for a while doing his postdoc, and then I think now he's doing right. a, uh, some sort of research agency in Washington, but he does a lot of work up here still. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, everybody. Anything, anything else before we wrap it up? Okay, well, happy holidays, everybody. Um, hope everybody stays safe and has a great uh, Christmas or however you're celebrating. And hopefully we'll see you in January or at the Ugly Sweater Fly Tying thing. I'm gonna hopefully check that out. So have a great evening and thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Right. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Will.
And thank you, Will. That was wonderful. Yeah, good job. Will. Yep. Thanks, guys.